I'm going to roll the roulette for you one more time. Yeah, you can see my arm is getting tired. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and tell me about Black Friday 20 years from now. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> kind of used my, 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 my crystal ball in the last one. Okay, if I'm going to say something a little bit radical, I'd say I could see, I could see, you know, Black Friday, you know, disappearing or becoming less, far less important. One late night we couldn't sleep, so we went on a shopping spree. We asked our partners and our peers about the future of retail and what it could be. Welcome to the Future of Retail podcast. I am your psych toast, Arif, and here with me today is Ryan Denroyan, the Chief E-Commerce Officer of Shalhoub Group, the largest luxury retailer in the Middle East. Thanks for having me, Arif. Please Thank be you here. for being with us. Ryan is a seasoned digital technology executive with deep expertise in bridging the gap between brands and their customers. And Ryan was also named one of the top 100 people in data-driven business in the UK, as well as one of the top 10 data futurists. Did I mess up your intro? No, perfect. Yeah? Okay. So Ryan, as you know, uh, we are doing a TikTok podcast. And on TikTok, when you introduce yourself, you have to write a bio. And there's a character limit to that bio. So we're going to challenge you to introduce yourself uh, with 80 characters only. And the viewers, they're going to see on the screen whether you're going to meet the 80 characters or not. So over to you, 80 characters. Changing the world one great team at a time, part-time dad, full-time dad jokes. You, you got it exactly right. Uh, it's almost as if you had rehearsed this and you knew I was going to ask you this question. Never. Uh, I was really hoping you mess it up and like we make you repeat it over and over again, but I, I, I guess you nailed it. So... Um, with that, uh, feel free to start the, the dad jokes because we're going to move to the first rapid session of this podcast. So we're going to start with a TikTok challenge. You ready? Have you participated in one before? Yes. Do you, do you want to share? I, uh, I got asked to participate in a, in a dance challenge uh, by some random people that I met uh, on the street. And how did you do? I'm not, I didn't, they didn't tag me. So I've, I've no idea. So maybe I'm like really big in Japan right now and I have no idea. <laughs> but it's somewhere on the internet. Somewhere on the internet. Yes. Okay. So we like to call it the last sunny corner on the internet. So thanks <laughs> for being part of it. Uh, today's challenge is easier. It's going to be a duet challenge. Uh, I'm going to duet with you. We have 10 questions, but only one minute. Uh, you can, um, Answer as much as you want, as long as you stick within the same minute. And one request is try not to blink. Okay? Okay. Cool. So on the watch, can we start and go? Ryan, how do you pronounce your family name? Den Royan. And what's the most common mispronunciation? Den Royan. What do most people think your favorite topic is? Data and AI. What is your actual favorite topic? God, my two-year-old son, Henry, by far. What is your biggest pet peeve at home? So I asked my wife this, and apparently I'm quite agreeable at home. But outside of the home, I hate it when they don't have fast track at airports. What is your biggest pet peeve at work? When people are like rude or dismissive to people based on their job title. Like, I really don't like that hierarchical stuff. Industry buzzword that pisses you off. Blockchain. Industry buzzword that you're guilty of using. <laughs> Transformation. Favorite brand within Shalhoub Group. I love all our brands, but I think what we're doing with Faces in Saudi is super cool. Uh, and I also love... Favorite destination to understand the cultural zeitgeist? TikTok. How do we do? We totally had time. We had like seven 53 seconds, seconds left. yes. Seconds left. <laughs> so you made it. First TikTok challenge. Thank you. <laughs> so um, the next section, Ryan, is going to be called POV. And today the POV that we want to double down on is going to be the output trap. I know that you recently wrote about this. Mm. Uh, we've read most, if not all, of your blog posts. Thanks for being one of my seven readers. Thank you. Alongside my mom. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your thoughts there. Uh, but honestly, this is the one that resonated the most with me because I face it every day. So I lead the retail and e-commerce team at TikTok, and every day we're working with a lot of retail and e-commerce brands. We have great conversations, but a lot of the time we are focused on output metrics. Mm. And the conversation tends to go... 
uh, this is the conversion rate, how do we accelerate it or how do we double the conversion rate? So one of the sentences I remember from your blog was, okay, great, we need to double the conversion rate, go double the conversion rate. How do you go about doing that? So tell me more about like the thoughts that triggered you to write about the output trap. I think triggered is probably the right word, right? Because I think many of us in, in e-commerce have this uh, maybe trauma, right, from 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 having worked, uh, you know, in, in, in and found ourselves in situations where you know it's very clear where you want to take the business, uh, and instead of people talking about what you really need to uh, you know achieve in order to to drive the business forward, all they focus on is like one particular output, right? And, and look, don't get me wrong, right? Knowing what your conversion rate is, knowing what your return on ad spend is, knowing what your, you know, gross revenue is, all these things matter, right? Because they give you an idea of the health of the business. But just talking about an output metric isn't particularly helpful, right? It's not particularly constructive. And so for me, it's really about how do we, uh, challenge ourselves to really drill into the things that actually make a difference, right? So for example, conversion rate, fine, yeah, I can double conversion rate, I'll just hot slash prices, right? And our conversion rate will double. Yeah. But is that good for the business? Of course not. And so at that point, it's really about kind of digging in and saying, what are the different factors that can contribute, right? Like, you know, how well is our brand positioned? What type of content do we have? What kind of audience, you know, are we are we engaging, right? What does the competitive landscape look like? And, and identifying like what kind of like the input metrics are that drive that output metric and focusing on those tends to you know, be much more valuable in the long term than just endlessly hammering those output metrics as much as it might be easy yeah. or easier to focus on those output metrics alone. And like in everything we do in business, it's all about balance. So it's about striking the balance between Absolutely. knowing your output metrics and definitely tracking them, but at the same time having the core conversations, like you mentioned, like one or two levels below that output so that you are having the conversation. So for example, Black Friday is coming up. Mm -hmm. Like in Black Friday, um, we like to work as partners with all of the advertisers on, on the platform. So we tend to not only restrict the conversation about media and media optimization alone, but if we are really looking into ROAS together, like what is the depth of your discount? And vis-a-vis -vis the depth of the discount of your nearest competitor, uh, how is uh, your stock situation going? How many shipment options do you have? And then again, how competitive are these shipment options versus other brands? Because ROAS, conversion rate, they are outputs and they are triggered by so many different, very interesting inputs that make the business cycle beyond media on its own. So Absolutely. That's why I, I, it really resonated with us. And what would be your advice for management to, to try to get out of the trap, the output trap, the way you call it? I mean, look, at the risk of being, 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 being flippant, right? I think it's, it's listen, you know, listen to your teams, right? I think particularly, you know, if I think back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, toward, towards this, like, like earlier in my career, you know, when you're you know, focusing on a particular aspect of the business, automatically you're going to be caring yeah. about those input metrics, right? Yeah. Like, you know, if you're starting your career as a copywriter, right? Or, you know, as a buyer, right? Or as a as a planner you or as a analyst. You care about the quality of your copy. Exactly, yeah, right? Yeah. You're focusing on your individual domains. The challenge is that when it then comes up to, to the executive committee, right? To the C-suite, you know, by that point, it usually has been aggregated so much that people say, just give me the numbers. Yeah. And I will I will you know, admit, you know, that sometimes I do this as 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 well because I just need some numbers. But I really try when we're discussing kind of strategy, right? Or I'm trying yeah. to get feedback to the team to go beyond that and not just say, oh, well, you know, we need to increase net revenue. Because to be perfectly frank, if I'm telling my team that we need to increase net revenue, I'm not adding any value at all. I mean, I'm probably destroying value by distracting them from the work they should be doing. Yeah. And do you feel like the industry is uh, like specifically behind when it comes to being in this output trap, given like the the immediacy of, uh, of the P&L management cycle? Because... I do come from a CPG background before venturing into retail a few years ago. Um, and we never reviewed the PL on a daily basis, right? Like we would definitely do monthly PL reviews mm. and like manage the top line and the bottom line. But with e-commerce, most of the partners that I work with tend to look at it specifically in high seasons, like Black Friday, for example, or peak sale seasons, daily basis, right? So does that put e-commerce specifically behind when it comes to other industries like more established industries like uh, FMCG or consumer packaged goods? Yeah, I mean, as I was going to say, I mean, only only daily. I mean, I think I've, you know, I think our data is refreshed every every five minutes. I mean, I, I think there, I mean, I think you touched on a very important point there, which is that 
you know, just because you have certain, uh, you know, data, data you know, doesn't access. necessarily mean that you need to, you know, use it. Continue all refreshing. The time. Yeah. yeah, absolutely right. And and so you know, for for us, uh, you know, as 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 as, as Shalup, you know, we always talk about how we really want to create these these these, these transformative experiences, you know, for our customers, right? We really want to focus on, on on this kind of like retail excellence. Now, of course, you know, at a certain point when you've got a dashboard, yeah. you can say, okay, well, really, these numbers just re represent that mission. So I'm just going to go all in on those numbers. Yeah. But the problem is, if you end up just focusing on those numbers, you know, you can use lose sight of the customer, yeah. right? And so I think it's incredibly important that you know you keep the customer at heart, you know, despite you know the initial technology that's brought in. I think the other aspect I think that's also really important to keep in mind is that you know just because you have a particular measure, right, doesn't mean that it automatically needs to become a target, right? Yeah. And so. Again, an example here is 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 you know something like like conversion rate where yeah. you know yes conversion rate is an important measure but just because you've got a high conversion rate doesn't mean your business is healthy exactly right yeah. like I mean as you say you know you could yeah. just be fire selling everything exactly right you know you're you're you know and completely forgetting about the yeah. customer experience overall um, and 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 you know kind of trick yourself into thinking yeah. you're doing well um, and so I think it's really important that that you kind of keep those things yeah. in balance so I mean it's like the Stephen Covey says in Stephen, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective start People, like always mind. start with the end in mind, right? So the dashboard is a means to an end. Absolutely. And sometimes because we have access to so much data, the means to an end becomes the end uh, in a way. Uh, but like you said, like if you are managing a business, like you want to manage a business with profitable margins, uh, you want to make sure that you are scaling that mm -hmm. business and focusing on something like only like conversion rate, could be, you could be driving it while having a, a bottom line that is not healthy as much as your top line, for example. Absolutely. So, uh, so always keeping sight of the big picture and the end in mind. So moving forward, Ryan, the next section is called Heart, Share, Comment. So uh, it's self-explanatory, to be honest, uh, but I'm going to explain it anyway. Do I get buttons? You know, like, <laughs> so, no. Can we see you? I mean, you can, you can press, you can try to press on stuff. Yeah, but green screen will and happen. on this plant, you know. Nothing will happen. <laughs> you, can, you can definitely try. <laughs> so uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to share with you some stats. Okay. Uh, some are going to be about the retail industry. Some are going to be about uh, the general uh, overall uh, state of e-com and UAE maybe. Some will be specific about TikTok. Uh, and you get to do three things about them. You can either say heart, if you heart the comment. Uh, you can say share, but then you have to tell me who do you want to share it with. Mm -hmm. Or you can pause and comment and like uh, have something to say about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so whenever you're ready, give me a thumbs up. Okay, cool. So first one, 72% uh, of discovery during Black Friday takes place online. Comment. Go ahead. All right. So... You know, occasionally I hear these stats and I worry that people misinterpret them and, and think, oh, you know, for these kind of peak trading periods, it's really important, you know, to, to have your online in order. I think the reality is this is just a new normal. Right. Like, I mean, just for kicks, next time you're in any kind of retail store, just walk around and kind of like non creepily look over people's shoulders. And in, you know, four to five cases, people are on their phone looking at the exact same product. Yeah. Right. And they're there, either reading reviews or checking out pricing. And so I think, you know, this is this augmented browsing experience. Right. I think is just a new normal. OK. I'm really like uh, actually interested in asking you more about it. But the format doesn't allow me, so I'm going to jump to the next time. Okay. So I'll cut uh, you off next time, okay, buddy. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so 62% of TikTok users discover products from an ad. Oh yeah, heart. Okay. The UAE retail market is expected to fully recover from the pandemic in 2022, and it will reach 79 billion dollars by 2024. So I think share. Uh, probably with 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 markets out with people in markets outside of, of the region, because I think you know uh, you know the, the UAE has done a fantastic job uh, in very quickly recovering from from COVID and just ensuring that you know we, we as retailers have kind of sensible policies in place, right? Because you want to obviously strike a balance between you know making your your customers and your guests feel at ease, but at the same time you don't want to stifle business. Uh, so I think you know we've we're we're a great example uh, for for other markets. Okay, thank you for sharing that. So the next one, 54% um, of our users on TikTok read comments before they decide to buy online. Oh yeah, comment. Go ahead. So it's not a dad joke. I, I genuinely want to comment on this. Uh, so I think... <laughs> 
we can edit out the laughter. I actually uh, just got it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, but no, but, but yeah, comment because, you know, I think on occasion when we talk about social commerce, right, or we talk about conversational commerce, there's this idea community that, commerce. Yeah, well, yeah, or community commerce. I mean, like, I mean, all, all sorts, right? I mean, you know, people think, oh, it has to take place, you know, you know, within an app, right? It has to, you know, it has to be, you know, this very kind of rich environment. Yeah. But the fact is, you know, consumers will find any kind of forum, right, to engage each other. Yeah. And you know, for example, we've seen that quite often discussion about our brands will take place on our, you know, uh, accounts and in our accounts comment feeds, right? Uh, and so that means as well that when you're talking about, you know, being where your customers are, right, listening to your customers, you know, also from a customer care perspective, you know, you need to pay attention uh, to literally every possible avenue. And that definitely includes uh, the comment streams on TikTok videos as well. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Uh, so moving on, one in two people buy immediately or within one hour of starting to shop online. Yeah, heart. Heart. Luxury. Uh, luxury represents five and a half billion dollars uh, in a $64 billion retail market, making the UAE one of the highest spending markets in the world. So share for this one. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd probably say people who are not in, in the luxury sector. Because I think I, I get I get a fair few questions from from other e-commerce folks outside of the luxury space to say, hey, why Fili, are you guys doing so well, and and why are you seeing this sustained growth? And I think a big reason for it is that you know there's been a bit of a a saturation when it comes to you know fast fashion, right? There's been a bit of a saturation with this you know you know buy now and immediate kind of gratification. And what we're seeing is that there really is this yearning, you know, for for quality, right? Not just quality in the, in the product, but quality in experiences. And it's a bit like food, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the occasional, you know, fast food burger. Yeah. But I love going to a nice restaurant, you know, even more. Like, it doesn't have to be expensive per se, but just really savoring the meal, right? Savoring the quality of the food. Uh, and I think when we, uh, as Shalhoub, talk about creating, you know, these moments of delight, right? Delighting, you know, a customer for a moment or a lifetime. You know, this is really the kind of... Uh, approach that we that we take to this okay fair enough uh we're nearing the end of this section so our very last stat for you 71 percent of tiktok users say that creators authenticity motivates them to buy from a brand by helping close the trust gap yeah comments so I think, I mean, first, I think that the term trust gap is a really, is a really interesting one, right? Um, and I won't derail this conversation by going into what can kind of cause it, but I think it's very important to acknowledge that, you know, especially in a market like the GCC, you know, establishing that authentic relationship, you know, with your customers is incredibly important. Yeah. And of course, in a physical retail environment that naturally happens, right? We have wonderful store staff and, 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 and BAs who can really make someone feel at home. But the question is, how do you do that online? And of course, part of that we can control in our websites and our and our apps but of course it's also very much about the media ecosystem that we build uh, around that and of course you know creators on platforms like TikTok are very much a part about that of that thank you Ryan thank you Ryan for hearting commenting and sharing you're welcome this was heart share comment and our first round with Ryan and Royan chief e-commerce officer of Shalhoub Group thank you next time there'll be buttons <laughs> You can't have a TikTok podcast without sound. So we're going to move into a new section called Sound On. Love it. And the sound that uh, is living rent-free uh, in my mind right now is the text-to-speech sound. Are you familiar with it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We picked uh, three sound bites uh, mm. from uh, real speeches that you've done in the past, either blogs or speeches and text to speech from TikTok is going to read them out. All right. And then we're going to have you comment on each of them and like uh, double click on each one. This is so incredibly like meta commenting on a robot version of my own comments. But okay, yeah. yes, okay. let's do it. And this is the part where I awkwardly try to figure out how to play the sound. So bear with me. And here we go. If you want meaningful change, hire challengers. If you want meaningful change, hire challengers. No, no. With the same tonality. <laughs> Do it again. If you want meaningful change, hire challengers. If you want meaningful change, hire challengers. Exactly. <laughs> Do I get to be in a Pixar movie now? I, like, that is my dream, actually, a voice actor. Uh, do I agree with this? I mean, I said it, right? So I, I guess it be awkward if I disagree with it. No, I, 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 I remember the context. This was about, uh, this was about kind of like, you know, kind of business business change and I know I said it was a buzzword but yeah transformation look I think 
you know, one of the, the trickiest things that comes up when, when recruiting people is this term of cultural fit, right? Yep. Um, and look, don't get me wrong, right? If somebody, you know, comes into an interview, you know, and they're, and they're racist, right? I, I definitely do not want to, you know, get in an interview. That's not the kind of challenging we're talking about. No. So. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, you know, on occasion, culture fit gets taken too far, right? And, and, and people basically end up hiring people that are just going to, you know, think the way they do, right? They're going to agree with everything they say. And then we ask ourselves five years later, oh, you know, why is it, why is this company not innovative? Why, why is this company, you know, not aware of the kind of things that are going to disrupt them? And, and I think that's because there's just, you know, this kind of uh, monoculture, right, that emerges. And so I think if you want to stay fresh and if you really want to, you know, keep up with the consumer, it's so important to find people who think differently, right? And then again, that can be a generational thing, right? It can, it can be an ethnic thing, right? It can be a, a, a background, a nationality thing, a uh, professional career thing, right? You mentioned you came from, from CPG. Yeah. I think it's just important that you've got people that can challenge the status quo in a respectful, non-racist fashion. Yeah. Um, because without that, you know, it just becomes much, much harder to have that kind of impetus for change. Okay. Very, very, very clear. Um, I'm going to move to the second soundbite. Subjectivity and scale. It's a catch-22. Do you want me to do the voice again? No, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, subjectivity and scale, it's a catch-22. Yeah, okay. So here I was talking uh, about the fact that quite often if you talk to, you know, e-commerce leaders, right, or, or brand leaders of, 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 say, kind of like smaller businesses, right, they say, oh, well, the thing is, Ryan, you know, my, my brand's unique. Right, uh, and therefore we need all these really detailed, customized solutions because otherwise we can't grow the business. Nobody wants to do what the other brand is Absolutely, doing, right? Right? They're like, they're like, you know, they're like, we're we're special. And and look, the fact is, you know, from a, from a brand heritage perspective, right? Maybe from a team perspective, you know, like they can be very special. At the same time, you know, when it comes to e-commerce, the reality is that 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 mostly, you know, it's the same foundations underpinning, you know, the success, right? And so there's a bit of a kind of like a a a, a, a catch twenty two or a paradox in the sense that you know if you want to have that kind of custom treatment, right, and and it tends to be the small brands that that want this, yeah. you know, you're not going to get that right until you're big and the reality is that the things that'll get you to that stage of being big aren't those custom inve investments they're just getting the basics right you yeah. know having you know a really great technology foundation right having a really good ability you know to listen and respond uh, you know to your customer right having really relevant you know product and and content you know and these things you know might not be you know, that special or, or, bespoke. or bespoke, exactly. But they're absolutely foundational uh, to getting, you know, from, 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 from you, know, you know, where you are now to, to whatever your vision of success is. How many brands within the Shell Hoop group? So I think we have just over 300. So do you find most brands uh, benefit from the scale uh, or? or have yeah, so commenting on e-commerce, we probably have about 30 brands online right now. Uh, you know, I, I think we've seen a tremendous, tremendous benefit. I mean, a really simple example, you know, it was that of, of of customer customer care, right? Where you know uh, you know when you are when you're when you're trying to have different processes, right? For every single brand, it's very difficult yeah. to do things well, right? Particularly when you're trying to service a market, you know, as 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 exciting and as dynamic uh, as 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 KSA, for example. And so for us, it's really about saying how do we create these best in class capabilities? Whether we're talking about content, whether we're talking about last mile, whether we're talking you know about the technology and product experience, whether we're talking about customer service. And then, of course, making sure that every single brand is able to leverage those capabilities while obviously still imbuing it with their own brand DNA, yeah. right? Their own look and feel. Yeah, clear. So uh, we're going to move ahead to the last soundbite for today. The E in e-commerce no longer stands for easy. Did this stand for easy, though? I, I, I look. I think. I think. You know, does E and e-commerce stand for easy? By the way, I, I nearly thought the voice had cucumbers, and I was like, <laughs> the, the E and cucumbers. I'm like, why cucumbers? Then I realized, okay, e-commerce. Uh, so I think you know there was definitely that assumption for a, for a while. I mean, we all remember. Uh, you know, if we haven't suppressed all memories of 2020. You know, at the beginning of pandemic, you know, how people viewed e-commerce, right? They said, oh, it's a rocket ship and it's just going to go up, right? And e-commerce is going to eat the world. Let's just go online. Yeah. A lot of people said, you know, hey, you know, like stores are going to disappear, right? Or we're going to see drastically less stores in future. Uh, and, and for a while, you know, e-commerce was pretty easy. You'd ask people what their strategy was. And they said, well, you know, I'm going to launch a website. And you said anything else? Well, no, because you launch a website and you make money online, right? And of course, what we've seen, particularly over the last 12 months, is that 
you know, the environment has become a lot more challenging. You already mentioned competition, you know, yeah. acquisition costs are, are, are way up. Uh, you know, we've seen that, uh, you know, supply chain disruptions have had a big impact on, on the kind of product and assortment you can make available. You know, rising fuel costs have had a massive impact on, on logistics and, and last mile. And so the environment is suddenly less rosy. Now, yeah. for the people whose entire e-commerce strategy was, well, you just launch a website, you make money. I mean, I don't think they're having a particularly good time right now because it actually turns out that e-commerce is pretty damn hard. If you actually want to, you know, have a sustainable, profitable business that can actually delight the customer. Yeah. And so I think, you know, we're seeing cases where either people are, you know, cutting back on that customer experience, right? So, you know, very often it's picking the region, you see that people will have either no returns process or a terrible one. I offer, I ordered a shirt from a retailer and I was told that I had to bring this shirt that I'd bought online back to a store that was like 20 kilometers away from my house, right? Clearly it's a cost saving measure, but does it delight the customer? Not really. Or alternatively, you're seeing brands do things or you know, players do things to kind of keep up the demand generation, such as, you know, heavy, heavy discounting. But of course, longer term, that damages the brand uh, and will probably reduce uh, demand for those products in future. So I think, you know, you know, it is possible to, to still run a profitable, sustainable e-commerce business, but it's pretty hard. Okay. So what does the E stand for now? Oof, um, you know, <laughs> effortful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Exciting, energizing. Uh, look, I mean, I, I think all those things uh, as as well. But I think, yeah, realistically, it just it just takes it just takes a lot of effort, right? I think there's a, there's a formula for physical retail that still works very well that can be planned in a very structured, methodical fashion. I think when it comes to e-commerce, you know, it's a it's a it's an awful lot of work, you know, uh, and and I think you know, arguably worst of all, nobody's quite sure what the next you know year or two is going to look like, right? So yeah. it's not just about you know solving for these you know clear and present challenges, it's also about maintaining that cultural agility and developing capabilities yeah. that you might need to counter, you know, whatever else the future may bring. Clear. Thank you, Ryan. This was the sound on section of our podcast and it wa went slightly less uh, awkwardly than I thought with the iPad. So thanks for that. All right, Ryan, our next segment is my favorite segment. It's called Roulette of the Future. And it's my favorite segment uh, because today when you say the word future, specifically in the context of uh, retail, mm. uh, everybody seems to have the same uh, perception of it, which is everybody's wearing VR headsets and shopping in a virtual space. Uh, and I'm not denying that that could be a version of the future. However, f the future has horizons, right? So the future could be two minutes from now, a couple of days from now, or 20 years from now. And uh, the version of uh, retail and e-commerce is likely to be different across different horizons. So we've created this uh, gamified version uh, today called uh, Roulette of the Future. We've chosen three topics. Uh, one that is very close to your heart, Shalhu Group. Uh, one which is the retail industry in general. And one which is Black Friday, since it's coming up. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to roll the roulette with you twice on every topic. Depending on where the roulette lands, uh, you can just uh, briefly explain how you imagine this topic being in that specific time frame. Sounds good. Cool. So let's get started. Our first topic is going to be Shalhoub Group. And you can do the honors of uh, clicking in the middle of our roulette. And let's see where we land. Okay, in five years. So where do you see Shalhoub Group in five years? Okay, don't hold me. Don't hold me to this because I'm not great at predictions. Uh, but I, I, I would definitely uh, expect, you know, our, 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 our business to, you know, have embraced, you know, omnichannel and and, and e-commerce, you know, even more than we have already. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we've we've made incredible progress, right, from from going from a couple of percentage points uh, of e-commerce to 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 now being being well into the double digits. Yeah. But especially if I look at markets like like Saudi Arabia, you know, we're seeing such a demand, particularly from the younger generations, you know, for these you know digital and omnichannel experiences, uh, that as we you know continue to meet that demand, I think automatically we're going to see a larger share of the business you know be contributed uh, by by those channels. Channels. You know, that said, I think there's obviously the, the what. I think uh, there's another element to it, which is the how, right? So uh, we also know that, that, that the way that the business has operated over the, over the past, uh, you know, decades, you know, is, is, is changing, right? Um, so we know 
that, for example, from a sustainability perspective, you know, it's really you know important, uh, you know, that we keep doubling down uh, on 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 improving, you know, our our ways of working. So this means, uh, you know, focusing on things like, you know, uh, you know, uh, the circular economy, right? Okay. So 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 you know, recycling and and, and upcycling uh, uh, products, you know, pre-loved, you know, as well as obviously continuing investments uh, to you know reduce you know our carbon footprint of our operations uh, and ensuring that we're you know really a positive force and continue to be a positive force in the environments we operate in. That's a very articulate uh, prediction of five years from now. Uh, so you did great. So can we roll it one more time on the same topic? Sure. Next, mm, almost next week. So shall hoop group next week. Uh, I think, you know, that, um, you know, the slightly flippant answer is, well, I hope that most teams are going to be on holiday because they deserve a little bit of downtime after a very uh, successful uh, first half of the year. Uh, I think um, a slightly more in-depth answer is that, you know, during during these kind of, uh, you know, slower periods in the year, you know, we tend to focus a lot of our efforts on thinking about our organizations, thinking about our talent, etc. And one of the really big topics right now is also saying, how do we ensure that we keep, you know, building our our, our, our talent pipelines, particularly when it comes to uh, local talent, right? Uh, you know, I mentioned sustainability from an environmental perspective, but there's also this kind of question of, you know, how are you integrated in, in society? So something in particular that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at at the moment with my team is how do we bring you know, even more trainees you know, into the business? You know, how can we you know, establish further relationships, you know, be it with schools, be it with uh, you know, governments, you know, to make sure that, you know, yes, we're you know, building our business from a, from a financial and, and a purely operational perspective, but we're also continuing to uh, you know, build and invest from a talent perspective. Sounds like you have a lot on your plate next week. Uh, but I'm only on holiday in two weeks, so <laughs> okay. you know next week I'm still working. <laughs> All right, so our next topic uh, is going to be Black Friday, uh, and if you can do the honors and roll the roulette. Okay, Black Friday five years from now, how's it different than 2022? So extrapolating, extrapolating a little bit, I think, you know, we've seen that these, you know, peak moments and these kind of peak activations, you know, have been kind of starting, you know, earlier and earlier, right? Um, so I think in, in five years, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we're going to, you know, find ourselves in September and, you know, brands will be running promotions, yeah. right? Trying to, trying to, uh, you know, get your hard earned dollars and dirhams. Now, I think the interesting question is, how do you do this in a way, you know, that's sustainable, right? So, you know, with many of our, many of our brands, for example, we talk about, you know, not just, okay, how do we, how do we, how do we discount, but, you know, how do we really create these, you know, uh, you know, special moments around these kind of holidays and events, right? How do we make sure that we have, you know, exclusive products, right? We just launched, you know, pre-order functionality on, on Swarovski, for example, you know, that can be an exciting part of that experience. Now, of course, you know, uh, you know, if if you uh, you know look at at the kind of broader landscape, I'm sure there will still be people you know heavily discounting. But I think when it comes to you know the future and really creating that value add for the customer, I think we can't be as lazy uh, as as to stick with discounting. Right? It's about creating these kind of custom you know product capsules. Yeah. It's about creating you know this custom content and really figuring out how to make this you know festive period well festive. Clear. So, uh, Ryan, we're going to stick to Black Friday, but I'm going to roll the roulette for you one more time. I can see my arm was getting tired. Now you're... <laughs> and tell me about Black Friday 20 years from now. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> kind of use my, 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 my crystal ball on the last one. Okay, if I'm going to say something a little bit radical, I'd say I could see, I could see, you know, Black Friday, you know, disappearing or becoming less far less important uh, and i think there's two reasons for it one is that you know there's certain holidays that have really focused just on shopping right just yeah. on buying yeah uh, i think when it comes to you know gen z and and again, 20 years right they'll be the ones ruling the roost yeah. Uh, I think that kind of hyper consumerism will probably have died down somewhat. Um, what I think will take its place, you know, because of course you'll ha still have promotions and activations, I think are much more these kind of localized moments and experiences, right? So 
obviously we know you know Ramadan and Eid yeah. are important periods uh, from a, from an e-commerce perspective in the region. You know, this year, uh, you know, with Faces, we ran a whole campaign, you know, which was you know kind of all around you know giving, right, yeah. and really about you know, making others feel feel valued. And there was much more of an emotional component to it than yeah. oh, yeah, buy one get one get one free, which like I said is a little bit easy. So I can imagine you know those types of approaches, and that kind of creative mindset being much more important, you know, 20 years from now, even more important than it is today. Okay, great. So 2042, like there's a theory that humanity would have reached the point of singularity by then, but that would take us uh, down a completely very, very different tangent. Singularity is uh, always 20 years away. That's yeah. it's like fusion. <laughs> so uh, Ray Kurzweil. But anyway, so we're going to move, uh, we're going to come back to retail. Um, the third and last topic for the roulette is going to be the retail industry in the MENA region. Uh, and if you can do the honors, roll the roulette. So the retail industry in the MENA region in 20 years. Um, wow. So these, these, these 20 years ones are tough. Uh, I, think the, the, I think the number one thing, especially if we're looking at it from a regional perspective, is that it's really going to be regional. Yeah. Right. So I think also for us, you know, we've got many great, uh, you know, international brands. I mean, you know, Tory Burch, uh, you know, as, as, as one example. And I think historically when these brands came into the region, they would say, OK, well, you know, we're we're effectively selling whatever we're selling in the U.S. or in Europe in the region. Right. We're going to use the same advertising, pretty much the same product lineup. Right. It's also why, you, you know, you go into certain stores, uh, I hope not for our brands, but certain stores in Dubai Mall, and you'll see them selling you know, winter coats in the middle of summer because there's just a certain range right, that they're making, making available. Um, I think, you know, we've done a lot of work, uh, you know, with our brand partners to say, how do you create truly, you know, localized and, and, and regionalized experiences, right? How do you make sure that your products are really, you know, made for the market, right? Made for the climate, you know, made for the fashion sense of the region. How do you make sure that you create content, right, that is relevant and representative of our local audiences, right? How do you create promotions uh, yeah. that really appeal, you know, to the, to the local, uh, uh, you know, the, the local customer? And so what I think is going to happen, in, especially in, if we're talking 20 years, is that this is going to be the norm, you know, for everyone. So whereas, you know, now, you know, like we, you know, with, you know, we have the capability and let's say we have the investment to do it, you know, together with, you know, uh, you know brands like Level Shoes and, and Trano, et cetera, you know, we can make the investment. In 20 years, I think everyone, you know, will have to make this investment because it will just be what the consumer expects. Okay. It's awesome listening to you uh, down these 20 year horizons because... <laughs> For most people, it's difficult to, to answer these questions. It's difficult for me. I'm just making this stuff up, you realize. <laughs> no, because, no, because uh, I mean, growth happens in an exponential way, not in a linear way. So it's, uh, it's quite, uh, it's easier to predict where we'll be in a year from now versus 20 years down the line. So thank you for going down this uh, game uh, with us. You get to roll the roulette one more time, if you can. Did I get to do it as a reward yes. for answering yes. the last one correctly? I, I okay. was going to flip a coin, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have the last one after this, you know, we'll, we'll share equally. So, uh, oh, the retail yeah. industry in MENA next week. Um, actually, it's also a tough one because it's a tough, I think it's a, it's a, it's a tough period as is all, all, always, you know, for, for, the, for the retail industry, right? You've come off a bunch of promotion periods. A lot of people uh, are looking to travel, right? Looking yeah. forward to reconnect with, 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 with loved ones who might live outside of, outside of the GCC. Um, so, I think at the moment, you know, again, aside from, from people going, uh, going on, on holiday, a lot of, of the focus is really thinking about how can, can we kind of create, you know, relevant offers and experiences for those who maybe aren't traveling, right? Okay. Uh, or how do we, uh, you know, make sure our offer is relevant, you know, for those uh, people, you know, looking to pull together the right kind of look, right? I mean, I, I know plenty of people that drop by Level Shoes, you know, for some last minute, you know, advice and shopping before they go on holiday because their wardrobe is such a big, 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 big part of it. Now, I will admit, you know, some of our brands like Toomey have a much easier time because you kind of need luggage if you want to travel. Uh, but I think for, for all our brands, you know, uh, again, customer centricity means, you know, being relevant to the customer, not just in a vague general sense, but in a very practical here and now sense. Okay. Thank you so much, Ryan. This Welcome. was Roulette of the Future. I, I wanted to do a little drum roll, but I was told it uh, impacts the sound of the podcast. So yeah, mini, Gen mini gentle, drum roll. gentle drum yeah. roll. Uh, but thanks for that. That was Roulette of the Future. Ryan, thank you so much uh, for bearing with us through all these different sections. We are nearing the end of our podcast and we're going to end on a very uh, succinct section called uh, Reply to Comment. So uh, we have chosen a comment uh, from the community uh, and we're going to ask you that question to wrap up our conversation today. Sounds good. So the comment is, 
What is the best advice that you have ever gotten in your career? In my career, wow. Um, I'd probably say, don't be afraid to ask for help. So I think, you know, as 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 much good as as the internet and and social media has done more more broadly, I think one of the drawbacks is that we're surrounded by images of of people at their best, right? Because let's be honest, right? I mean, I mean, yeah, okay, fine. There's some very funny TikToks of people, you know, looking 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 pretty miserable. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, people tend to only post on social media, you know, if they're if they're doing really well. And the reality, of course, is that human life isn't just about, you know, feeling great and being happy all the time, you know? And I think, you know, career is a long time running, right? So, you know, there'll be plenty of moments where, you know, you need some help, you know, you might feel stuck, you know, you might be having a particularly bad day. And I think it's so important to just remember that it is absolutely okay to ask for help. As a matter of fact, I'm sure you can find some studies that, 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 that prove this, but I tend to find that relationships grow stronger with people you know, when you ask them for help, right? So you're not inconveniencing others. So, you know, I'd say particularly in this environment and and during a time where there's, you know, a lot of different pressures and challenges in the world, yep. you know, just remembering that, you know, it's okay to ask for help and, and it actually, you know, does a world of good. That's really good advice. You know, Ryan, like, uh, I know this was the last question, but I feel like we could go on all evening uh, with this uh, podcast. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. It seems like we're getting out of time, yeah. but thank you very much for a great episode. I, and I'd as for to, me, it's... I will catch you back of, in, with another version of the future in the future. This was Arif Yahya with Ryan Dunroyan, Chief E-Commerce Officer of Shalhoub Group. Thank you very much for being Sounds with us. Sounds good before they take away our mics. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. You're welcome.